so um, this was going to be a general network session. I was going to talk about the current state of network driver development and all that stuff. I'm going to let Steve talk mainly about driver development tomorrow. Um, I'm also not going to talk about how to install a Gen Act driver. I've done that over and over and over again. Newer versions of ECS do a much better job of installing the Gen App driver um, with a lot less fussing and playing with it. Um, if you have any questions about options for the Gen App driver, go to the Wormstock website and pull down one of my previous oh, presentations. Yeah. They're all there and they've got all the step by step. Mainly today, I want to talk about. WPA and what the different debug screens look like from the WPA supplement when you're having trouble getting connected. And we're going to talk about WPA and all that stuff in a minute. This is a little bit about me, and again, you can download this from uh, the Warpstock website. Um, I got a new certification. Um, where is that? That, where's the one that gets me? There? Red button should do it. Yeah, it should. <laughs> maybe, like maybe, yeah, maybe, that. yeah, maybe that's what our problem is. Yeah. New well, the, the light is on and glowing for me. Just roll the batteries yeah. every now and then. Oh, oh that right. was the M lit up? The M is lit up right now. Switch it off. Yeah. I pressed it, but it didn't go off. Press it again. Hold it. Where's the finger? <laughs> 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 ah, there we go. All right. I added a new certification last year, uh, or actually earlier this year, called the CWTS, which is Certified Wireless Technical Specialist. It is um, one of the certifications available from the um, Certified Wireless Network Association. <laughs> um, which is a, it's a handy certification. It was uh, a few hours of studying. I do a lot of wireless work, so it comes in handy. Okay, so, some idea about uh, specifications, and this isn't stuff that you need to remember, I'm just trying to give you some context here. Uh, we have a number of ways to trying to apply some security to the wireless edge. Well, the first way, of course, it's not very effective, but it is common, is obfuscation of client identity. Meaning, uh, obviously, and I, I shouldn't have even put this in here because this is, this is just a basic network thing. In other words, don't tell other people in the network who you are. Hidden SSID will have an access point and will give you the option to turn off broadcasting of the SSID, as we call beaconing, which used to work fairly well for open networks, in other words, unencrypted networks. For WPA, you need the SSID to be broadcast. WPA will not associate with Connect if the SSID is hidden. MAC filtering. Again, it's not very effective. Um, what MAC filtering does is in, in, in the, the access point, you say, do not allow this device with this hardware address to connect to this network. But MAC addresses can be spoofed all the time. So if someone got one of those roadblocks in front of them, thought maybe it's my MAC address, then I'll go the other way around. Now, there is a reverse to the MAC address filtering, which says only allow these MAC addresses to pass. But like anything else, you can have a very simple code generator that just keeps rolling through MAC addresses until it hits one that goes through. So it's not particularly secure. And once the connection is made, of course, unless you have some other means of encryption, everything's in the clear anyway. Um, Wired equivalent privacy, WEP. There are two different flavors of, of WEP. Um, 
typically referred to as 64 bit and 128 bit. But really, it's 40 bit encryption and 104 bit encryption. Because 24 bits is the initialization factor. 24 bits says, OK, this is the web key. So every time you get to a web encrypted network, the first 24 bits are going to say, OK, this is the web key. So you lose 24 bits out of 64 immediately. Then you have those silly four strings that you need to plug in to your client in order to make the web uh, keys work. And then tell your client, all right, start with key number one. Well, that's terrific, except anyone sniffing air traffic is going to see all these keys passing. And it doesn't take more than a minute or so to capture enough packets to know what the keys are in the first place. That's why web gets broken so easily. 64 bit, 128 bit web work exactly the same way, but the keys are twice as long. What, what are the other three for? Like I have to set up a mind that I had to put in four, but I only ever use one of them. What are the other three for? And well, normally they it rotates from one to the next to the next to the next. If you only fill in one key, it'll rotate one to the one to the one to the one to the one. So that's less secure than if you fill in all four keys. I did fill in all four, but once I'm authenticated into the network in mm -hmm. my in my apartment, uh, I never did ask for anything again. So no, it won't. Connects. Oh. What, what won't oh, okay. do that? Um, sometimes you'll hit a network that, and, and the, the sign will say the network passphrase or the network password is such and such. Normally that refers to a WPA passphrase. But I've got one network that I connect to on a routine basis. And after a bit of sniffing around, it turned out that it wasn't a WPA passphrase at all. It was the first web key and a 64-bit web. And that was it. That's what the passphrase turned into. And I connect there all the time. Just one thing done. Um, it's not very secure. In the beginning, it took, it took days to capture enough packets to decrypt. Now it's minutes, seconds. Um, WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access. The original WPA came out before the standard um, 802.11i was ratified in 2004. Um, and it is a subset of that. I'm going to talk about the difference between WPA and WPA2 in a, one of the next slides. It's more secure than WEP, but there have recently been uncovered flaws in WPA and WPA2 that make it susceptible to, to crime. <clears throat> and let's put everything in perspective. I can encrypt the connection between here and the access point. What that means is that anyone listening to the airwaves won't be able to read what I'm sending easily. Once it gets to the access point, it's all decrypted anyway. It just goes out like any other down. So anyone who's watching that connection can pull that data right out. So if I have an email account, and I send my username and password in clear text to my mail server, what's going to happen is whatever method of encryption I use here is going to encrypt that from my machine to the access point. It's going to decrypt it, and it's going to go to plain text from there on out across the internet. How secure is it? <clears throat> it's not secure at all. True security is SSL encryption point to point. When you do a credit card transaction, and you're doing that credit card transaction with a secure site, HTTPS, on the other end, it doesn't matter whether this air is unencrypted or it's encrypted. Because your connection to the other endpoint is encrypted. That will stay encrypted. Anyone sniffing it over the air, is going to get encrypted gibberish. So none of this stuff really matters. Um, WPA2 is the full 802.11i spec as it was ratified in 2004. Uh, does everyone understand how 802.11 becomes 802.11a, b, d, e? Okay. 
802.11 is an IEEE standard, and it defines um, wireless networking. Different amendments to that define different types of wireless networking. 802.11a, for instance, defines 5 gigahertz wireless network, what we call um, well, what we call A network, 11A network. 802.11b is 11 megabits networking. Uh, it runs over the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency. 802.11g, so when we talk about BG devices, that's yet another amendment to the 802.11 spec. 802.11i is the amendment that deals with um, Wi-Fi protected access encryption methods beyond the original WEP encryption. 802.1x deals with authentication, not encryption. In other words, who are you? Not let's keep you safe. All that it does is authenticate who's using the network. 802.1x is normally used in large enterprises where there's a wireless network, and we need to know who is getting on to the network. Who's going to have access to corporate resources? Who could possibly trespass through the corporate network to get to the internet? So we have some method of, of authentication beyond just sharing a password. 802.11i 2007, although it looks like 802.11i 2004, essentially wraps eight different 802.11 amendments into one bundle. And they were really unchanged when they got into this. So we refer to all, all modern wireless networking, um, except for 802.11n. All, all wireless um, networking security <coughs> as wrapped up in 802.11i 2007. What does that mean? Well, let's see if we can put something back to good use. In ECS, we have XWLAN, which is the, the widget or the standalone uh, uh, application with which we can uh, create profiles, monitor wireless connections, and turn the wireless radio on and off. It includes in the package the WPA supplement. WPA support is built into Windows, and it runs as a standalone application on Linux. This WPA supplicant that we have is an older port of the supplicant that runs on Linux. That's the thing that does the encrypting. If all those encryptions don't do much besides hide it for the uh, trip to the air, why use them at all? Well, that's a very good question. This is an open network here. Uh -huh. I don't use it. Anymore. On my mail server, I support SSL, 1024-bit SSL encrypted end-to-end -end connections. My mail application is configured to use encrypted username and password. So my username and password never, never traverse the wire or the air on encrypted. Whenever I'm doing a credit card transaction, it's always encrypted. I don't have any networking running on my machine to allow someone to back into my machine remotely over an open network port anyway. So encryption doesn't do much. Now, with that being said, you mean the WPA and web and all that stuff? Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really do much. But I'm going to find myself in situations where the person running the network is not me. Uh-huh. And now I have to conform to whatever he's using if I want to get onto his network. I mean, some people are convinced that all this encryption stuff really makes a difference. And as a result, if I need to use the network, I need to be able to navigate my way through that maze. That's essentially what this session is. Now, I, like I said, my brother-in-law, I set up a, a wireless router for him, and I just put in one of like WEF or WK one, so you had to put a password in. Now, the only reason I thought to do that was somebody driving down the street can't just park and use his network so easily. They still, if they did that other thing. That's, essentially, that's, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, it locks down the access point for access. But there are all sorts of different ways to do that. 
you can use a captive portal technology like they do here. Where, in other words, if you want to get onto the network, sure, you can get an IP address and you can ping past it. But you can't browse the net, you can't get email, you can't do anything else. So you open up a web browser and tell us who you are and why you need to be here. Um, since one of my companies is a Wi Fi company, my wireless router at home is on that network. Anyone driving by is welcome to use my hotspot. Pay me $8.99 a day, and you can get access. And the router's configured to firewall any of those connections from the rest of my network. So I don't mind sharing my, my broadband. My broadband costs me a flat fee every month. If I have 50 people on it, or I have no person on it. I don't care. So pay me nine bucks if you want to use it, and I'll block you from getting to my private stuff with firewall rules, and out you go. Help yourself. So there, uh, where I'm staying now, at my friend's house, he has a little Cisco router. Links it. Cisco, of course, bought Linksys. So every time someone talks about a modern Linksys router, that person will pay attention to everything. When people talk about modern Linksys routers, they may say Cisco, they may say Linksys. It's all the same company. Most of the newer devices give you the option to create what they call a guest network. The guest network is essentially unencrypted, but it presents a, 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 a captive portal. So you say to your guest, oh, here's the, pass, here's the password. So your guest connects to that SSID for the, the guest network. And as soon as he opens up the web browser, he gets a, a captive portal page that says, what's the password? And I'll let you go. There's no encryption on it. And off he goes. That's a much better way of blocking unwanted traffic on your network than doing any of this stuff. Why right. encrypt all the traffic just to, to do that? And especially now that we can sniff all of the encryption keys out of the air for any of the methods that we use, what am I doing? I mean, you know, it's like if everyone in the neighborhood puts a key to the front door under the front mat, how secure is anyone's front door? It's what's behind the front door. It's the alarm system. It's the Doberman picture behind the front door. <laughs> That's what keeps the, the house safe. To, to a certain extent, though, I mean, if you're in a neighborhood and you just want to keep so, sort of nuisance level uh, availability of what you're doing, how it, I mean, most people aren't going, most, most people who are not serious about breaking into uh, encrypted the traffic aren't going to use these techniques. Well, in that case, if, if you just want to cut down on, on, on transits, in other words, someone driving by with an iPhone, with the Wi-Fi turned on, I'm very conscious of that iPhone. When I'm around my network, I turn on Wi-Fi on my phone. Because my phone doesn't have a great fire with it. And someone can theoretically hack into it, of course, it's a, it's a Palm device. It runs WebOS, which is based on Linux. So it's got IP tables, it's a firewall, it's got very basic protections in it. But I have private information on my phone. I don't want to do that. So when I'm not around a network I know, I turn my Wi-Fi off. No problem. But on one of our installations that we manage for the, uh, the city of New Rochelle in New York, we have an access point at the train station. Holy cow. The number of iPhones and Blackberries and Android devices that come onto the network for five minutes and then go off. It's amazing. Every time a train pulls in, people get off the train. <laughs> I get 50 IP addresses. And then they leave. And then 50 more address addresses fall back into the pool. So <coughs> if you want to stop that kind of traffic, then the MAC address filter. So, yeah, so then those, the, those devices won't get IP addresses, period. Done. They're not there trying to tap in maliciously. They're just sniffing. You know, it's like, if you don't want your dog to stick his nose where it doesn't belong, then, you know, freshen your sample a little bit. That's all. That's why there won't be anything interesting here for um, <laughs> So there are better ways to do all this stuff, but still we have to contend because there's a lot of hype. Oh, I have to secure this. Oh, I have to secure that. 
If you can hide your car. If someone wants to get in, the person's going to get in. If my only connection is a, I have it on for a couple of hours while I do some stuff. Mm -hmm. I, my neighbors are all my age. They're not looking at anything. If I'm going to go set, buy something from PayPal that's going to a, uh, that's secure yes. end to end. Then I, I don't need any of that. Right. Stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If you're at home and, and you know you read articles that are on both sides of this, you know the, the X percentage of, of users don't encrypt their their wireless networks at home. It's it's a real problem for home. I mean it's not really a problem. Granted, if your network is completely open and unsecured. And you have machines behind the firewall because you're, when you realize all this traffic is coming in behind your firewall. This is onto your LAN now. This isn't from the outside coming in. These people are just, it's like you put a jack outside your, your front door and say, snap in, right? If you have machines there that are unprotected, Windows machines that are always promiscuous, they'll let anything connect anywhere. Then obviously cutting down on that traffic is a concern, and there are multiple ways to cut down on that, on that traffic. I just think that encryption is kind of a heavy-handed approach to do that because the the uh, the common misconception is, oh, if I encrypt my network, it would be safe. No, that's not what encrypt. I mean, that's what encryption is supposed to do. But there's no lock that can be picked. So what do you need to do? You need to take the door away and put a brick wall there. That will stop them from coming through. That's a different story. You know, you, you put a block and mortar wall up, now you can't just pick something to get in, you know? Well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take those kind of quotes with a grain of salt, though, because you gotta remember that the people who are, are writing these articles, largely, not all of them, but largely, they are talking to experts and they're picking out bits and pieces out of what people are telling out them. Out of context. And yes. taking it out of context. Uh -huh. so, and what they end up doing is, is is whipping everybody else who knows even less than them yeah. <laughs> into a frenzy. Yep. Yep. And then that person tells his brother who knows even less than him. And then they pass it on and pass it on. So what started out as, as, a, as a snail or as a, a, a tick or whatever, ends up being a whale or a dinosaur. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's, yeah, there's another aspect yeah. to this too. Mm -hmm. You're only at risk if you're running servers. Right, and as, I was, as I was saying before, if you have something behind there that's open to allow people but to, by definition, a client's not open. Because it's not <laughs> listening for connections. Well, the definition of a, a normal client is not listening for connections. But in the Windows world, everything is listening. That's right, because there's a bunch of servers that they don't tell you about. Yeah. It's a different world. I mean, people don't realize that peer networking means that I'm wide open to let people connect. Right. That's what peer networking is all about. My single OS2 or Windows laptop sitting on my kitchen table mm -hmm. for the next three hours. Mm -hmm. No one's going to be hacking into me. You don't, it depends on what you're running. That's the whole point. Well, the point of is course I'm running OS too. No, no, no. And when they find that on what services, services you're running on that, on that machine. Oh, okay. So if, you have, if you're doing file sharing on that machine, and you have an open network, well, people can connect to you and file share. Right. You know, all those private files, they'll be shared. Yeah, like assuming, they can get, assuming they can guess the password. Right. right. Yeah. But if nothing have is shared on my laptop, I don't share anything because then, then that's an That's why I say right. the better way to deal with that, with that whole scenario of keeping people out is to authenticate them at the border right. and then direct that traffic where it should rightfully go, which is in the, the access point and out to the internet and not to any other machines on their network. Because mm -hmm. the main problem is that there's like a difference between uh, Windows and let's say OpenBSD. Uh, when you do a, an install of Windows, it's expecting that you want to do this, you want to do that. It, it'll leave a lot of ports open by the fall. By the fall. Whereas if you take something that like uh, OpenBSD, which is a security paranoid, uh, they close everything by the fall. 
And so if you want if you want a service and you want a port open, you have to actually go in there and open it yourself. You know, they're at the other end of the spectrum. And so you, you never know exactly where you're at and a basic install of Windows if you're just an ordinary user because you just don't know these things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why the Windows machine is so so vulnerable. So that there are people can go into your machine and do something, but everybody was able to get in. Yeah. <laughs> so like, like, like I said, if you don't have those services running, then it, it, it is a true client. And it's not uh, letting everybody connect. It's, it's definitely right. with us. Because those ports are, are closed. That's right. Now the thing is, you can be a pseudo server without knowing it. And that's your typical uh, Internet Explorer's mode, which is running JavaScript, which acts as a server. Right. Once someone actually gets control of it. Kind of like the, uh, the was it MySQL? Uh, mm -hmm. the well, that's a real, that's a real service. <coughs> here, no one would think of the browser as a server. So, once you go across mm -hmm. moving, moving on through, through this stuff. On the access point side, AP stands for access point. The other thing with the antennas, it sits in the corner, gets dust all over it and has the blink up lights. Um, typically, you're going to get a few different choices for encryption on these things. WPA Personal or WPA PSK. The PSK stands for pre-shared key. The pre-shared key is really a passphrase. It consists of 8 to 63 alphanumeric characters. A six-character passphrase is not legal. WPA. It's too short. A 64 character passphrase is not legal for WPA. It's too long. Um, the passphrase is case sensitive. Uh, I said alphanumeric. It doesn't have to be just alphanumeric. You can use special characters as well. Including spaces. Now, Including a, spaces. Is this a PGP style shared key or is it a Different type of uh, a PGP style it's shared key. No. 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 It's no. not a hex string. It's a string of no, random. Right. No, right. It's not really. 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 It's not It's Well, I'm going to show you how the handshake works and how the, the key is used in the internet. Okay. Okay. It's going to be used to generate a random number. Essentially, that's what the keys are going to be used to do. Um, WPA Enterprise, EAP stands for Extensible Authentication Protocol. All that means is that one vendor can build on that and put his own extensions on it. EAP. Hmm? What's the EAP? Is pro, um, Cisco has Leap, then there's PEEP. Um, it's just a form of EAP. Yeah, it's, it's a form of EAP. I don't remember exactly what vendor uses P. I think Microsoft does. Microsoft uses P. That's weak. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I can't remember what that first P stands for now, off the top of my head. Um, you, we're not going to need to be con concerned with this. Frankly, if we were concerned with this, we would have another bit of software running on the machine to handle that layer of the transaction. Essentially what that does is authenticates us to an authentication server running behind the access point. So again, if you're running on a Cisco network, it's running a Cisco <coughs> leak, then there will be an application to allow you to enter your, your password and pass that on to the server in the back. You don't store it like a pre shared key. Key is um, protected. What's yeah. that? Protected. Protected? Yeah. And leap is lightweight. Lightweight, right. right. Um, WPA2 personal or WPA2 PSK. WPA2, and I'm going to talk about the difference between WPA and WPA2 on the next slide. There's WPA2 Enterprise, and then there's WPA, WPA2 Personal Mixed. Only this, in some states, right? <laughs> only some states allowed. 
<laughs> this is the most flexible of the authentication protocols on the access point side. What this does is it tries to negotiate a WPA2 connection with the client first, and if that fails, it falls through the WPA uh, transaction. It tries to associate that way. So if there are some devices that only do WPA, some devices do WPA2, this will accommodate both of them. Um, if you are running ECS machines on the network, which I assume would be, um, with the WPA supplement that we have now, you're going to want to configure at least for mixed if not for this. Our, our WPA2 that's available with this build of the supplicant is not really up to the proper standards. You will find a number of access points reject our attempts to handshake. Yeah. And WPA involves a four-way handshake. I'm going to show you how that goes in a moment. Um, on the client side, we have the option of WPA, PSK, WPA2, PSK. As I said, we use an older port of the supplicant, and it's not always compatible. I'll show you in a couple of slides what, what the debug looks like when you're trying to connect to a network and you're not getting the point across. Um, the difference between WPA and WPA2. WPA introduced Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, which means that it rotates the keys with the access point, the client and the access point, at intervals decided between the two devices. So it's not as predictable as rotating through four letter keys, four letter keys, four letter keys. It changes those random keys. The two of them negotiate when they're going to change random keys and go from there. That's what made it more secure in the first place. The encryption mechanism is the same in WPA as it is in WEP. It's RC4 encryption. 128-bit RC4 encryption. So if you have 128-bit WEP, it's the same encryption algorithm. The difference is that these keys change at different times. So it makes it a little bit harder to sniff what the keys are. WPA2 introduced CCMP. Of course, we never call it CCMP because it's so much easier to say AES, Advanced Encryption Cipher. Uh, no, sorry, Advanced Encryption. All right, go ahead. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the three. Advanced Encryption System. What's this? System problem. Um, AES is a 256-bit cipher, so it's tighter encryption than WPA. That's, of course, where our older port of supplement fails, is that it doesn't properly apply 256-bit encryption to the, the cipher, so it's flawed in that regard. If you happen to find an access point that's around that same vintage, They'll probably talk to us about what is it? Standard. Standard, thank you. Probably one of the questions on my test. <laughs> I knew it then, I knew it then. Lewis, we get about five minutes, I think. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to be pretty quick. Yeah. This is the four way handshake. When, when devices are trying to authenticate via WPA or WPA2, the access point sends an A nonce. An A nonce, a nonce, is a random or semi random number. It sends that to the station. The station is the client device. The client device builds a, a response based upon a random number and the passphrase and sends that back to the access point. The access point is able to construct its own response, sends that back. When the act comes back from the client, everything's talking. Trust me, if the passphrase is right, after this comes out and this goes back, this is where it's going to break down. The access point is going to talk again. It'll just fail. 
the client will notice that it fails and it will try to reconnect again, causing the access point to start over from the top. And this loop will continue if the encryption is not right, if the passphrase is wrong, this loop will continue. Um, this is exactly what I just said. The AB sends a, a nonce value to, to the station, an A nonce. We get a different nonce value from the station back. The AB sends uh, a sequence number with with another message integrity code. That's going to be used so that they can start to, to talk to each other. Finally, the, con the confirmation gets sent back to the access point. Now, this is what happens when you configure for the wrong SSID. So now I tell my system, I want you to connect to um, an XYZ network, but the XYZ network doesn't exist. So I send it out, and nothing comes back to me. See, I'm looking for a network name. The name is SSID. Could not find the network. Zip. And it'll go back, and it'll try to look for it again. So if you find that you're not able to connect on the, the, um, the wireless landmark, there's an option for the WPA sub. If you go there and then you say uh, visible, it will show you this debug window. And a lot of this data is going to scroll through. Notice I got a scroll bar over here. This is going to repeat. Blah, 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 blah. Scanning can't find it. Scanning can't find it. Scanning can't find it. But this gives you an idea as to what you're going to be looking for in the midst of the, the noise. Can that be configured to be written to the lock file? Um, yeah, I think when you turn up the verbosity, it writes it to the entry. Okay. <clears throat> this is a passphrase error, okay? I entered the wrong passphrase. So we try to start our handshake, right? And we're going along, we're going along. Key management, right? Um, oh, this was this was a, a, a too short passphrase. See, invalid passphrase length. I entered I entered a six character passphrase. Failed to set network variable. It was too short. The supplicant tells me that. The access point doesn't tell me that. The supplicant tells me. So it doesn't permit it to go out even? It doesn't even, it doesn't even broadcast. It's not legal. There's no way for it to use that to encrypt. What is this coming from? This is coming from the debug. The, the WPA supplicant log, you can make visible when you're doing a WPA connection in XWA. This is coming from the WPA supplicant itself. It just opens the window to show you what it's doing. And you do that with a flag or something? Yeah, well, there's, if you use XWLAN on the menu, uh -huh. there's something that says WPA supplicant, and then it says visible. Oh, okay. This is what it looks like when it's visible. Mismatched methods. In other words, I've got uh, an access point that's doing WPA2, and I'm doing WPA. <coughs> and they try, and they try, and it fails. It fails. And it'll start over from the top C. Um, Setting scan request right here, that's the next line after this, disconnected scan. Then start scan request, and this will keep going down like that. Was that my? my it wasn't, but you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do I have time for like three more slides? I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, this is a bad key. I've got the right, I have matching methods. Okay, four-way handshake. The problem is that they, the passphrase that the access point is for is not the one that I have. The one that I have is of a valid length, but it doesn't match. So since it doesn't match, this will start over. It's going to try to send it again and again and again. The access point is going to keep saying, I'm sorry, it doesn't match.
Here's WPA with no handshake. Now, why is there no handshake? Sometimes it takes a while. The biggest problem I see that people do is they panic. It's not connecting. It takes a while. Give it a minute. Give it a minute and a half. Give it two minutes. If in three minutes it doesn't connect, then assume that there may be something wrong. I go through this with VPN tunnels all the time. The tunnel didn't come up. Something must be wrong. No, no, nothing's wrong. All this stuff is timing sensitive. If one is talking and then it disappears and the other one's talking and this one comes back up, they have to start over. And they have to negotiate who's at what stage of what again and <clears throat> try to make friends. Well, you have to make some time to make friends. So here, I've got no handshake happening. They're, they're not, they're, everything matches, but they haven't had time to get, get things in order. This is mixed mode. There's no handshake happening here either. Um, I don't remember why this one was like this. This may have been because the, uh, I think the keys matched. But I think that, um, I think what happened here, yeah, I changed the key while the transaction was still in process. And I didn't stop the transaction and start it. So the supplicant didn't reread the configuration and pick up the new key. That's something else that you <laughs> if you If you see that you've got a screen that looks like it's not connecting, stop it. Turn it off. Turn the radio off. Change the, the parameters and then restart the transaction. Changing the parameters afterwards isn't going to stop the train that's already left the station. It's just going to keep doing what it's doing. <coughs> That's what a successful handshake is. Everything comes down here, authenticating success. The entering state is now disabled. Uh, the the, the e entering state is now disabled, right? Authenticated, it's idle. Scan results are six. The start when is zero. That's what we're looking for. At this point, this log stops. The supplicant's done. It finished. This isn't going to scroll anymore. It did all of this business. They shook hands. They got all the way through group handshake. It's completed. I'm on. If I look at my, my XW land monitor, I've got green bars. I'm connected. Everything's perfect. That's what you want to see when everything works right. Um, this is general stuff. If it looks like it's connected and you still can't go anywhere, check your stuff. Make sure you have an IP address, which you should have already had. Or you do the other stuff. Yeah. Um, you never got here if you didn't have that. You wouldn't have. You can't send without an IP address. Yeah, without an IP address, right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have. Um, basic troubleshooting, right? All of your standard network troubleshooting applies to this stuff once that connection is all of that, that noise was just a matter of getting the connector plugged into the jack. At this point, the connector's in the jack. If, if nothing's working, then we need to start running the down the list. And you can't get out to the net. I can't get to www.google.com while well, try digging. Right? See if you find out. What the, what the IP address is for Google.com. Dig is a little bit nicer than NS Lookup. We don't bundle dig with um, the ECS. We probably should, but we don't. On a Linux distribution, you say NS Lookup, it says deprecate. Exactly. It is. <laughs> <laughs> on a Windows machine, too. on a Windows machine, NS Lookup is there. Yeah. And dig is. They misspelled IP, I have from dig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, so did Linux, so you can't complain too much. What to check when it won't work, we just talked about. Other OSs, if it really won't work, boot something else. See if that works. What are the things on the dig, though? Because it's being used with um, Marty's um, implementation of <coughs> the verbal protocol of the talk of message. Mm -hmm. 
um, if you don't have a domain listed, it doesn't always come back with that in there. You sit there and just kind of hang. So, so you gotta go into your yeah. Call. I try one of my routers. If I add the domain there, it'll. I run into that also. It doesn't. I you cannot get a lookup if you don't have a domain listed in Resolve Two. I don't know why that is. I, I I honestly don't know. But a couple of my routers don't plug the domain in when you get the HTTP information. Mm. And I open up NS Lookup or, or Dig, and I get nowhere because it's not in Resolve Two. Now, what what am I? It's weird. Is so the router doing the DNS thing? Same one. No. No. Right, because those options are pretty much constant. Who changes? Well, them? most of the time, the router will give you the option to so specify a domain or not. And it will say in the router configuration page, some ISPs require a domain. So if your ISP doesn't require a domain, you leave it blank. Then when it doles out your DHCP information, it leaves it blank. Yeah. So you end up with domain in Resolve 2, just domain and nothing. Yeah, the other fun one is uh, like probably most of us get, I use static most of the time, and I'm sure that this thing's probably blown up my resolve too because of the DHCP. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, card stalls, the Wi Fi card can just die and stop stop broadcasting. Sometimes if you've got a newer, a newer laptop, a newer ThinkPad, it's got a, a switch for the radio. Physical switch, you can try switching it on and off. But most of the time, it's a reboot. Or if you've got a Dell, make sure you don't have it in the look mode. In the look mode. Dells have a three-way switch. They have a three-way switch? Yeah. One is off, the other one is check for signal, and the third is oh I'm really off. <laughs> and Jerry's our Dell expert. He's been burned by that. <laughs> try another machine. See if you're the only one with this problem or not. Um, and then some IP stuff. Okay? INET ver, make sure that your IP stack is recent. If you're running ECS 2.1, I would imagine your IP stack would be fairly yeah. you know, like The newest available for 2001 or something. Yeah, that makes sense if you're running yeah. now 1, 2, or yeah. 4. Yeah. And just because another machine Yes, it's the ECS driver. Then a, a, a soft, a warm boot will probably get the driver reload and the car will take off. But if that doesn't do it, then a power cycle may be in order. If that doesn't do it, then, you know, for any other reasons, the car can get really confused and you might need to actually pull it out of the sun and plug it back in. It could be a PCI where the PCI bus is confused and it's not initializing the car problem. This is more. No, the car doesn't get an IRQ. It's not going to work. <laughs> and it's PCI, so the BIOS is going to assign an IRQ to it. And if for some reason it's not reading the car properly, it's it's just not going to work. The driver's not going to load properly. Yeah. So in extreme cases, that that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I've seen it. Um, yeah, it I don't see it often, but it, it happens. It really depends on what's not working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have problems getting the radio to turn on, if, if XWLAN says to you, no car detected, and you know that your driver's in there, and it worked yesterday, then you know there's some reason the driver didn't initialize the car. If it didn't initialize the car because it didn't see the car, then that's likely a hardware issue. And you might need to pull the thing out and plug it back in. I've, I've got a, a Cisco 304 PCMCI card, and I, I run uh, DHCP. I get this, the IP address today, and there it is, dot .114, works fine. So now, my system's not up all the time. So two days later, I'll come back in, gives me the same IP address, it will not connect. So I go and do all the power off, power down, turn around three times and spit, and then connect. Yeah, you know, it could be, if, it, the way DHCP works, and we're actually on, we're on break right now for a couple of minutes, right? Well, we're all against each other. Okay, so we're <laughs> against yeah. We'll talk about that in yeah. next break or something. Yeah.